number of years ago, I got a call from the librarian's office. Um, a businessman from South Korea wanted a tour. We have two acres of maps, five and a half million maps. And since I knew he was from Korea, I took him back to the Korean set area and just opened a drawer, just a random drawer, I opened it up, and I saw maps there that I had not seen before, which often happens in a collection that large. And uh, these included a map of Pyongyang, North Korea. pulled one of them out and I gave it to him. And uh, there was just a, a long pause. He didn't say anything. And then he finally said, and people do this with maps, he finally pointed to it. He said, that's where I was born. And you know, out of five and a half million maps, what are the chances of that? And several weeks later, I received a letter from him. And he thanked me for the tour. And then he apologized. He said, I'm so sorry that uh, I couldn't respond immediately when you showed it to me. But I was just overpowered with emotion. And when you look at art or paintings, you stand back and want to get an impression of the overall view. But when you look at a map, it almost pulls you in because you want to you have that relationship that goes back for a long time. What can we do with maps? Well, most of the people still think that maps can be used just for geography. Maps can, can, especially nowadays, can be used to trace and understand the global circulation of knowledge and people. So you use maps as lens through which you detect or you try to understand uh, links or uh, how to say connections between several people in the world at the world scale like if you get in contact with people from the 17th century for instance that helps you to understand yourself in the 21st century so you have to make connections horizontally in this time but also vertically uh, so at earlier times uh, it's very important, I think. It is not just about maps or world, world, world views. Just, it is also related uh, the ways how, how people understand the other people. So that's very interesting. Those, the people misunderstood or understood uh, the other people's way of life and the, the other people's uh, way of understanding the world. So that kind of interactions, misunderstanding and understanding, conflicts or accommodations, that, that would be really, really interesting topic to me. Maps, uh, which was really um, at the center as a theme of this symposium, is something that fascinates a great deal of people. 
And these maps from the 16th and 17th centuries really are snapshots of how the people of those um, centuries and those different places saw the world. So they're not just about going from point A to point B, but they include all sorts of information on them about the peoples that they encountered, the fauna, the flora, astronomical data, uh, ethnographic data. I call these maps from the 16th and 17th centuries their version of Wikipedia with hyperlinks. Yeah, regional maps tend to be more functional. They, they could be administrative for, for tax or for uh, topography. They could be military-related re uses. World maps are different in that you can't fit everything on them, but what you fit on there is your cosmology, your view of the world and the universe, how the world fits, uh, how the, the continents and how the people on them live. So the world maps uh, that were done both in Europe and in China have all kinds of unusual details. They have uh, the products and produce of different countries, uh, what the people look like, if they wear strange clothes, the animals and insects and, and uh, animal life that live there. Let me start from a conversation I had in the fall of 1989. This is with a, an elder Chinese scholar, somebody I deeply respected. And he and I were having a, a meal of jiaozi, so these little dumplings. I remember this very clearly. And I said to him, we were reflecting on what had happened on June 4th, 1989, and I said to him, as an outsider, uh, the culture remains closed to me. I remain an outsider. And of what point is it for me to spend my life working on something from which I am ultimately excluded? And he said, you've got that completely backwards. He said, Think of Chinese culture as a room. He said, and think of me as someone who is inside that room, who sees every inch of the walls, the ceiling, and the floor, knows everything, that can see everything. You're the outsider, you're standing outside. You don't see anything of what I'm seeing. There's a window, all you can do is look in. But he said, all I can do is look out. I can tell you what's inside the room, but I have no idea where the room is. You're outside the room looking in the window, and you can tell me where we are. And that's why you have to continue what you do. It's very important. My collaborator Ann Waltner and I were brought together by a mutual friend, Kathy Barbash. She knew that we were both equally curious and fascinated by Matteo Ricci's map, the depiction of space, and the music and possible narratives that could breathe life into his journey. We chose music that resonates not only with Ricci's life in Italy, but also with his travels and experiences in China. We combined that music with scholarly researched texts, images of the map generously supplied by the James Ford Bell Library at the University of Minnesota, and newly composed musical works by American Chinese composer Huan Ruo. This project creates an interdisciplinary performance that tells a different story than that accomplished by music, words, or images alone. This unique combination of media uses the ephemeral nature of sound to open doors to our audience's minds and hearts in a way that speaks to the complexity of Rishi's experience and to the complexity of the relationships that often result with cultural exchange. The scholarship that grounds every aspect of this work generates a nuanced and multi-layered performance that is unique and special. The collaboration that is essential to our work permeates all aspects of the project and results in uncommon combinations of artists and scholars. We collaborate with specialist Chinese instrumentalists the musicians of the early music ensemble Sakabuche, and a Ming Dynasty specialist historian. We consider ourselves fortunate to have been able to collaborate with the Ricci Institute at the University of San Francisco. Indeed, the generosity of the people working at the Institute and the exchange that took place between our team and the Institute is not something that we commonly encounter. Oh.
1571, at the Feast of the Assumption, the 19-year-old Matteo Ricci entered St. Andrew's Quirinale in Rome as a Jesuit novice. He took with him a coat of old cloth, three shirts, three books, and a towel. He recalled those years in a letter written on November 15, 1594. Things from my youth are more vivid in my memory than anything else. The events of my early years in the Society of Jesus return to me most often and are most deeply rooted in my heart, especially the generosity with which you helped me and directed me on the path toward virtue. Those memories remained with me throughout all the years in China. If I had not been able to hold fast to the memory of the things God showed me when he drew me from my parents, then I would have been in even greater peril than I was. 
In October of 1571, the same year Ricci entered the novitiate, an alliance of Europeans led by the Venetians defeated the Ottoman Turks at Lepanto in pitched and bloody battle. October 7, 1571, dawn, the wind from the east, a fine autumn day. Hurtling toward each other, the two fleets were quite a terrifying sight. Our men in shining helmets and breastplates, metal shields like mirrors, weapons glittering in the rays of the sun. The polished blades of the swords dazzled men full in the face, even from a distance. And the enemy, they were no less threatening. They struck fear in our hearts. We were amazed and wondered at their golden lanterns and shimmering banners, bedecked with thousands of astonishing colors. So great was the roaring of the cannon at the start of the battle that it is not possible to imagine or describe it. A mortal storm of shots and arrows flew, and it seemed that the sea was aflame from the flashes and continuous fires, lit by fire trumpets, fire pots, and other weapons. And death came endlessly from the two-handed swords, the scimitars, the iron maces, daggers, axes, swords, and fire weapons. Other men drowned by throwing themselves into the sea, thick and red with blood. I saw the wretched battle site myself. There has never been such a disastrous war in an Islamic land nor in all the seas of the world since Noah created ships. The total reckoning of men lost was more than 20,000. The young Cervantes, who was wounded in the battle, characterized it as the greatest event ever witnessed by ages past, present, and yet to come.
中，曾在果阿停留。在一五七八年的一封信中，有人这样描述果阿的繁华景象 ：This is the place for merchants to fill their sacks. This city is at the center of all trade routes. Here come goods from every direction. Here one finds Jews and Gentiles, Moors, Persians, Arabs, Venetians, and even Turks themselves. There is no better place for soldiers because armies are formed here every day. But for those who are lazy or pleasure-loving, life is so good here that it would be better for them if it were not quite so good. 成功问及利希泰，希泰大西域人也，到中国十万余里，出航海至南天竺，使之有佛。已走四万余里矣，即抵广州南海，然后知我大明国土，先有尧舜，后有周孔，驻南海肇庆积二十载，凡我国书籍无不读，请先辈与定因事。请名于四书敬礼者解其大义，又请名于六经书义者通其解说。今尽能言我此间之言，作此间之文字，行此间之仪礼，是以其标志人也。
中即玲珑，外即朴实，数十人群聚喧杂，愁对各得，望不得以其间斗之始乱。我所见人，未有其比，非过亢则过谄，非路聪明，则太闷闷晦晦者，皆让之矣。但不知到此何为。我已经三度相会，毕竟不知到此何干也。亦其欲以所学，亦无周孔之学，则又太无余，恐非是耳。
When we talk about a research institute like this, uh, I think we need to remember that we're at a university, and of course, the European idea of university, the universitas in Latin, is basically a universal community of knowledge. So people who are pursuing different types of knowledge, but they're doing it together. And in Chinese, the word da xie, which is um, the word for university today, actually comes from a Chinese classic, uh, which is called the Great Learning. And this was a classic book on how to organize society in harmony and how to do that by beginning with self-cultivation. I think one of the things we're trying to do at the Ricci Institute is we're trying to bring together these two traditions. The uh, Western tradition of community of learning and the Chinese tradition of self-cultivation, the pursuit of knowledge and harmony. And I think that is something that is reflected in our name. It's the Ricci Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History of Encounters Between East and West. And so I think it has to do with finding a place where we can both meet. I was asked to give a little talk on the Ferdinand Verbis to Kun Yu Chuan Tu, which is the world map of 1674. Uh, it's in a long line of Jesuit maps, starting with Matteo Ricci and his world map, uh, and later Jesuits like Eleni and Sambiazzi and Martini wrote, did other maps. And uh, Verbis actually did the map uh, as an instructional aid to the emperor, to Kangxi. He had been, uh, the Fer Ferdinand Verbis was a Flemish uh, Jesuit, and uh, he had, uh, as the result of winning a, a competition against other astronomers and other astronomical forms, he was appointed the court uh, observer, observatory manager and astronomer. Um, I'm the curator of the James Ford Bell Library at the University of Minnesota. We have been fortunate enough to have the James Ford Bell Trust acquire the Ricci map, which is one of the centerpieces of both the exhibition here and the uh, conference. Mr. Bell was very clear when he started the library that the materials, however rare they might be, would be available to everyone. Caring for it and preserving it is one aspect, but sharing it is really the, the biggest thrill for me. So, ですね、こういう万国全図で面白いことっていうのはね、例えば、え、それまでの日本というのは、あ、世界地図っていうのは仏教系の仏教の考え方に基づくこう世界がこう逆三角形になっている世界だったんですね。それその三角形の世界地図
He learns the culture. And so he then becomes an observer. You follow his observations as a way of perhaps filtering and thinking about your own observations. He's the sensitive outsider who comes in and reveals a great deal about China during this period. And in traditional China, uh, Chinese people thought that China is the center of the world. And uh, Chinese, China is the only country or only nation that is civilized. So all of the others are barbarians. In Chinese, uh, we, ha we call China Zhongguo. That means the country in the center. <laughs> so uh, when uh, the missionaries introduced the European geography uh, to China, they told Chinese people that uh, we have a whole world. The global is around a circle around a global. So, um, and China is only one part of Asia, the continent, the Asian continent. So it changed changed a lot the Chinese view of the world. Between the shared common part of life and the difference in, the, in our lives will bring people together from different perspectives. And that's um, and oftentimes in research, and uh, one of the things that the Reach Institute has been trying to promote is to um, bring both aspects together and then particularly paying attention to the voices that have not been heard. And that's what we're trying to do. So speaking of, you know, Ruby's map, and the impact on the Chinese uh, scholars and Chinese people. A curiosity leads to you know, more you know, discovery and probably more discovery, more curiosity, and then a fine opportunity to understand more. Uh, what have impacted people and what will continue impacting people is the friendship, the idea of friendship. And that's what Matteo Ricci uh, started soon after he uh, at his residence in China and uh, talked with Chinese scholars and he tried, he tried very hard to promote that particular understanding, what that means. The organizers of the conference have actually recognized this link between cartography and cultural you know, thinking and the way we look at ourselves. But this story about how NASA has affected the way we understand the Earth and see ourselves um, goes back to 1960 when we sent the first satellite up with a television camera on it that took pictures of the Earth. When we got those first images of the Earth floating in this vast, empty desert of space with nothing, in some ways it's a very scary picture because it shows how fragile and how precarious our situation really is and therefore how much we really need to take care of the Earth. When I came to work at NASA, people were just starting to realize how complex the Earth system really is and that the subsystems of the Earth, the oceans, the land, the atmosphere, and even life are all interacting with one another. And this whole idea of Earth system science was born and NASA Right when I went to work for NASA, had developed a program to build satellites to study all of those pieces and do it simultaneously so that we could see how they interact with one another. You know, as technology develops, we can take people to parts of the planet that they might never actually visit, you know, the top of Mount Everest or to Antarctica or to the Amazonian rainforest, and explore those places in, in virtual reality and really experience what it's like to be in those places. And increasingly to do that collaboratively, do that you know, with a group in a classroom or, or with your friends. And that's, I think, a fantastic experience for people. You know, it's, it's an emotional experience.
And so when you see these images of the Earth from outer space, especially when they do the time-lapse photography and you can see the, the seasons on the globe, it's fascinating because when you look at it, of course you don't see the lines of latitude and longitude, right? <laughs> They're not there. You see no national boundaries, which we tend to argue about on maps. It's just this um, organic whole, and going back to the time-lapse photography, when you can see the seasons change over the course of the year, you know, over the course of 15 seconds or whatever it is, it's almost like the Earth is breathing. So it's a little bit like now we have an opportunity again to understand our Earth, the globe, in a different way and to put back into our consciousness some of the things that came off the map. The project that I have just finished and that I think will also the, inform the next work that I do is animated by a desire to make these relatively unknown and difficult materials accessible to our students. So I have just co-edited a volume with a Japanese collaborator and an American geographer called Cartographic Japan, A History in Maps. The whole point is to unlock individual maps and make it so that my students in my classes and those like them all over the country can actually read a Japanese map, we've added English labels, can understand the context in which it was made, and can use it as a window onto some interesting chapter of Japanese history. To me, the entire environment of the Reach Institute is like a cradle. It nourishes human spirit. It nourishes our interest and our potential to grow, not only in terms of scholarship, but also in our own being and uh, in our relationship with everybody else and with the world. I have been very fortunate to get to know many scholars, young and old, from all nationalities, Asia, Europe, the United States, North America, Latin America, or I have been very fortunate to get to know a lot of people in the local communities who have been continually helping us in many ways. And I find it rewarding to get to know them as really human beings, as real people, just like me, every day. And then that, uh, what brings us together is this spirit of this excitement for something that we do that may be able to touch the hearts and mind of the future generations. If there's one you know, key uh, component in our work is to uh, promote the cross-cultural understanding through education research, but above and beyond is friendship.
当利玛窦来到中国时，他随身携带了很多书、几幅地图和两架地琴。他将其中的一幅地图挂在其住所的墙上。The more learned among the Chinese admired the map very much, and when they were told it was a view and a description of the whole world. They became greatly interested in seeing the same thing done in Chinese. The map is full of words. Some tell us about the map itself. Others describe the world it portrays. Ricci writes about how he made the map. 共乘大平六幅，以为书斋莫游之。阶阶，故出故停，历观万国，此于文件，不如稍补。Li Zhizhao, who worked on the map with Li Qi, summarized the appeal of the map by saying, "Di zhi bo hou ye, er tu zhi chu mo, dun shi wan li, na zhi mei jie." 八荒了如弄丸。The world is great and thick, but this map is made of paper and ink, and so in a moment you can gaze across ten thousand miles, and the eight expanses become like a toy ball. An influential scholar Wu Zuohai adds some details. Li Shan Ren. 自欧罗巴入中国，主山海与地全图，建身多传之。与仿其所为图，皆彼国中后有旧本，盖其国人及佛朗西国人，皆好远游。时经绝域，则相传而至之，期见年久，稍得其行之大权。The map depicts Europe as peaceful and prosperous. 此欧罗巴轴有三十余国，皆用前王政法，一切异端不从，而独崇奉天主上帝圣教。凡官有三品，其上主兴教化，其次判理俗事，其下。专治兵戎，图产五谷五金百果，酒以葡萄汁为之，工皆精巧，天文性理无不通晓，俗敦实，重古伦，物会甚盛，君臣康复，四时与外国相通，各商游遍天下。去中国八万里，自古不通，今相通近七十余载云
，于春年渐退，有往无复。促老暗亲，莫我数也。何为乎？窄地而引广厦，以有数之日，图无数之谋语。幸或今日一日，急急用之勿失。欲吾许明日，明日难保，来日之望，只期于乎？愚者，庆日立于江崖，似其河，而江水。急急流于海，终无节也。年也者，具有游意，莫怪其疾非也。吾不怪年之疾非，而唯悔吾之懈尽。以夫老将军。而得未成矣。My springtime years are receding; they are gone and will not come again. Old age silently encroaches; it will not spare even me. Why did I build grand mansions on narrow ground? Using my finite days to make endless schemes. At least I have this day. I will use it and not waste it. Do not count on tomorrow, for tomorrow brings no guarantees. Hopes for tomorrow are they not just lies told to deceive fools? A fool stands day after day on the river bank, waiting for the river to dry. But the waters flow endlessly to the sea. Until the end of time, it will never dry. The years they have light wings. No wonder they fly by so fast. I do not blame the years for quickly flying by. I only regret my own slow progress. Old age is fast upon me; my virtue lags behind.
have applied myself to the study of Chinese, and I assure your reverence that it is quite another thing from Greek or German. The spoken language has very few syllables, and many sounds may mean more than a thousand different things. There is no difference between them, other than pronouncing one with a tone that is higher or lower than other syllables. This is why, when the Chinese speak among themselves, they often write to make their meaning clear, because the written words do differ from one another. As for the characters, they simply cannot be believed if you have not seen them. On a 1603 edition of a map, a follower named Lien Zhu wrote, Feng Yingjing, another follower of Ricci's, wrote about the possibility of communicating across cultures also on the 1603 map. <laughs> Xin Xin Xiang Yin Bu Dong Jian Xi Bei Bu Shuang Er.